Hello, everyone, and happy Earth Day. Welcome to Lunch Break Science. I'm Ariel Johnson from the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting human evolution research and sharing discoveries in programs like this. We'd like to thank the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation and Camilla and George Smith, whose generous support made this episode of Lunch Break Science possible. Here with us today are Leakey Foundation grant recipients, friends, and research collaborators, Andrea Baden and Stacey Teacote. Thank you both for being here with us to celebrate Earth Day. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. It's exciting yeah, to be you. here. Yeah, it is. Uh, Andrea is joining us from New York, where she is an associate professor of anthropology at Hunter College, NYSEP faculty at the CUNY Graduate Center, and director of the Baden Primate Molecular Ecology Lab, and oh, also the Ranomafauna Ruffed Lemur Project in Madagascar, where she studies black and white lemurs. Andrea looks at how landscape influences their distribution, migration, and gene flow, and how genetic relatedness can help explain social behaviors that are complex. Stacy is joining us from the University of, or from Arizona, where she is an associate professor at the University of Arizona, and the director of the, I'm sorry, the Laboratory for the Evolutionary Endocrinology of Primates. I got that one. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> and the Ramna Fauna uh, Red Belly Lemur Project in Madagascar, where she studies, you guessed it, red bellied lemurs. Stacy looks at the behavioral and physiological strategies that are used to cope with environmental change and allow individuals to survive, grow, and reproduce. Together, they collaborate to investigate allomaternal care in red bellied lemurs to better understand the evolution and maintenance of facultative allomaternal care. If you're wondering what facultative elementarial care is, you will find out in the lecture portion of this episode. On this map, you can see their research sites in Ramnafana National Park, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site in southeastern Madagascar. Today, they'll be discussing their collaboration, their respective projects, and lemur conservation. Before we hear from them, though, if you are watching us live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or Leaky Foundation Live, you can submit questions for them anytime in the chat, and they'll be answering those questions during the episode live today. So be sure to get those questions in early. The earlier you get them in, the more likely they will be able to answer them live during the episode. So this is our first Lunch Break Science episode, believe it or not, where we are talking about lemurs. What do lemurs have to do with human evolution? <laughs> so that's a great question, and it's one we get a lot, um, especially being that we're in anthropology departments. Um, and I think there's this misconception that lemurs are really um, sort of too primitive or too distantly related to humans to serve as any kind of useful model for human evolution. But I think it's important to remember that lemurs are still primates. Um, and even though they are more distantly related to us than say something like a chimpanzee or a bonobo, studying their behavior and evolution across diverse primate lineages is still really important to understanding our own evolutionary history. Yeah, I think it's important to recognize that lemurs have been evolving just as long as us and other primates. And they have a suite of traits that are retained from our earliest common ancestors, but also several new derived traits. And they're also really great taxa to understand the evolution of social systems and morphology and behavior, because there are over 100 species with a range of all of these traits. And practically all the variation you see across the entire primate order is represented in all the lemurs that are restricted to just this one island. Right, and so lemurs can actually provide this really unique opportunity then, right, to understand um, and investigate behavioral diversity both within a lineage, so within the lemurs, but then also across the entire primate order in order to help us understand what uniquely human traits may have first evolved. So you both look at different species of lemurs, at least primarily. Uh, Andrea, can you tell us a little bit about black and white roughed lemurs? Sure, yeah, so rough lemurs are really cool and pretty weird because they combine both really primitive and more behaviorally complex traits. So I'll talk about this again in a little while with my talk, but briefly, they give birth to litters of young, so babies can't cling from birth, they're parked in nests throughout their early development. And so these are some really primitive traits that they share with plenty of other non-primate mammals, right? So they're really different even from most primates. But then at the same time, they also exhibit these highly fluid and socially complex 
fission fusion dynamics, akin to what we see in chimpanzees and spider monkeys and even human societies. And so this makes them a really interesting model for studying social evolution more broadly, but then also human and non-human primate behavioral evolution and what it actually means to be human. And so, you know, Rough lemurs are unfortunately classified as critically endangered by the IUCN. So experts estimate that there are fewer than 10,000 of them remaining in the wild. And um, unfortunately, it's really hard to get better estimates um, of their population size using traditional methods because they're so patchily distributed throughout the Eastern rainforests. Um, but what we found is that we can actually use molecular techniques, so things like Bayesian skyline plots, in Ronomophon at least, um, to estimate their effective population size. And so this is essentially the number of adult uh, uh, breeding adults within a population. And we're finding that um, really it's quite a bit smaller than current estimates suggest. And this decline probably began within the last 2000 years or so. Well, Stacy, um, would you tell us a little bit about red bellied lemurs? Yeah, sure. Um, red bellied lemurs are a little bit different, really different actually from rough lemurs. <laughs> and they live in both family groups with a tightly bonded pair of adults and their offspring. And they usually have one baby at a time, but they also have twins quite a bit too. <clears throat> They're pretty much always within eyesight of each other in actual physical contact often wrapped up in these balls with their tails wrapped around each other, sometimes with a baby hiding inside of that ball. Um, and they're almost never aggressive, which is one of the reasons that I really like working with them. Most of their behavior is spent sleeping, feeding, and maintaining these bonds and working together to mark their territories with scent marks. And some even call them Eulema rubra stinker because their scent is so strong. That's their scientific name, Eulema rubra venner. And one of the most notable traits is that they mate totally monogamously, which is incredibly rare for mammals, let alone primates. The um, population size of red belly lemurs is, we don't actually really know how many there are left in the wild. Their list is vulnerable by the IUCN, which puts them in the threatened species category. And we suspect that populations are undergoing a decline of over 30% over a period of just 24 years. That's about three generations. And they seem to be moving away from lower altitude areas and into higher altitude areas. But we really need better estimates so we can develop policies to protect them. You both work at Ramna Mofana National Park, but you had very different <laughs> paths to get there. Stacey, when did you become, or first become interested in studying primate behavior? Um, I'm really not sure where I got the idea, but I always <laughs> wanted to be a primatologist and imagine myself watching them in a forest. Um, I, you know, there are pictures of me as a kid in a room with like monkey wallpaper and monkey <laughs> couch cushions. And so, I don't know, it could have just been like the interior design of my house. But um, <laughs> this was really helpful because it gave me some direction in finding schools and mentors, but it also meant that there is no way that the reality was what my kid brain thought it was gonna be. So I spent a lot of my early life, or my life and like now too, all throughout my life, um, constantly reassessing whether this is still the right path for me. So like multiple existential, um, <laughs> moments. Um, and in college, though, someone mentioned that there was a primatologist on campus, and that's how I found my way to Linda Taylor, who was an incredibly patient and supportive mentor. She was in um, the Department of Anthropology, so to me, that's when that immediately became my major. And I even remember her writing, let's talk about your future in the margins of my um, exam, which I really needed at the time because I was totally naive and shy, and I'm not sure if I would have even gone to grad school without her mentorship. Um, I really had no idea what grad school was all about, and um, that was mostly because I just didn't know anyone that had been to grad school. My family hadn't been to grad school. Um, and so Linda, she helped me into a couple of experiences before grad school that were really formative and ended up really shaping the work that I do now. I had the chance to work with chimps and macaques and squirrel monkeys, and those experiences led to my decision to only conduct non-invasive research with primates. And it also made me really interested in knowing more about primates than just their behavior. So this led to my work on hormonal biomarkers. But at that time, not everyone was convinced that you could really do this non-invasively non measure hormones in things like fecal samples. But I've always been interested in using these tools to figure out um, specifically how the environment impacts the behavior, physiology, health of populations. So initially, I was interested in this from an animal welfare perspective, looking at squirrel monkeys and different types of um, captive, semi-captive cats, and that grew into more conservation biology and anthropological questions, 
about how species respond to environmental and anthropogenic change um, in the wild. And that's what led me to Madagascar. Andrea, I knew, I knew, oh, 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 we have a, oh, okay, I think we got, no, it's still, let me, is this, oh, okay, um, Andrea, I know you fell in love with lemurs early on, um, what was your path to studying primates? Yeah, so, you know, as a kid, I grew up in what was at the time rural Florida. It's not so rural anymore, but basically we backed up to the Everglades. And so most of my childhood was spent playing in cow pastures and exploring the woods behind my house. And so, you know, even from a really young age, curiosity about the natural world, um, it's always been there. Um, but I don't think I really... Um, appreciated how influential that those experiences were until much later on. And so, you know, unlike Stacy, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life until well into undergrad. Um, I knew I liked teaching. I knew I liked writing. I loved art. I liked being creative just sort of generally. And so that, le that led me to really bounce around through a bunch of different majors early in my undergraduate career. So, you know, I started with elementary education then switched to art photography, realized I wasn't good enough at that, switched to photojournalism. Um, and, and nothing really seemed to stick. Nothing felt quite right to me. And, and, um, and then I ran into Linda Taylor, right? So funny story. Um, we didn't know each other at the time, but Stacy and I both went to the University of Miami for undergrad. And so I think that Linda really was a driving force in both of our earliest academic careers. Um, so in my case, after taking a gen ed course with her, um, she recommended that I reach out to Pat Wright and do her study abroad program in Madagascar. And it was really that trip that changed the trajectory of the rest of my life. And so, you know, it was there that I realized that rather than just photographing the animals or writing these, you know, photojournalism stories about them, I much preferred to actually study them and try to understand them and try to protect them. And so I immediately came home from that experience. I changed my major and, you know, that's all she wrote. I basically started down this path toward becoming um, an anthropologist. And so once I made it to grad school, I immediately became interested in theoretical questions about social evolution. Um, and so, you know, the work of people like Joan Silk and uh, Susan Alberts and Jean Altman were, were really inspiring to me. And I was especially intrigued by kin selection and how it might um, motivate patterns of so social association in lemurs at a time when molecular ecology was just really starting to take off in our field. And you know, these kinds of questions were already being asked in species like baboons and chimpanzees, but they hadn't really been studied in any detail in lemurs. And that's how I came to, to study black and white rough lemurs and their molecular ecology. can't hear you. Um, Madagascar <laughs> is an amazingly beautiful place of incredible biodiversity. Uh, what were your first impressions of being there? Um, for me, Madagascar was the first place that I traveled to outside the US to study primates. And because I've been hoping to do this for years, I was super excited about the trip. I really didn't have a clear idea of what to expect. I remember preparing immensely in terms of like what to buy for my trip, but really had no idea. Um, and on that, my first trip, I really didn't see very much of Madagascar. At the time, it was about a 12 hour drive from the capital to Ranamafan. So I had all day to just view the scenery during that drive. But by the time we arrived, it was really late and dark and I couldn't really see where it was. And I was dropped off at the park entrance and hiked in by flashlight. And when I woke up in the morning, it was just this really magical and energizing place. And I think it was my first time in a rainforest. Um, so it was just like totally new to me. <clears throat> and I had no idea how things worked. Once again, I felt very naive in the, the situation I put myself in. Um, I was really grateful for my research assistant who came from the US but had been to Madagascar before. And Taylou Albert, who was my guide and teacher. Um, Albert grew up in the forest and he worked with my advisor, Deborah Overdorf. And now we've been friends and working together for over 20 years. He was incredibly patient with me. I think I, I had to take more hiking breaks than he was used to because <laughs> Ronald is not flat. It is really a difficult place. 
Um, and this was definitely a mental and physical challenge that his patients helped me overcome. And he also um, taught me how to find the lemurs, set up botanical plots, plots fecal samples, pretty much everything that I needed to do. And at the time, Center for Bio Research Station wasn't there. So we literally spent all of our time in the forest, working and living there, living in tents, um, except for an occasional trip into town to grab a can of tuna fish. So the rainforest was really my first impression of Madagascar, the, the whole country. <laughs> and so for me, um, having been there as a, an undergraduate study abroad, <laughs> my first impressions as a grad student um, where I was just, I was totally overwhelmed. Um, so the transition from going from a study abroad where, you know, your hand is essentially held throughout the entire process and you get to, you're basically just told where to go, when to show up, right? And you're kind of like an, an eco-tourist at the time. So it is just being able to take it all in. But then transitioning from that into a grad student where, you know, I was responsible for leading my own research project was a huge frame shift. Um, and so outfitting an entire project from the ground up was, yeah. was really scary. Um, and so folks like Sulu Justin and Felix Ratelo Lahi and Emil Rogerison, these guys really took me under their wings um, and mentored me through the whole process. And I probably wouldn't have made it without them. So, you know, it was really Felix who initially pointed me in the direction of Mangebu because on um, his earlier expeditions, he had noted these unusually high rough lemur population densities there. So he said, okay, you wanna study them, you gotta go to Mangebu. Um, Emil led me on my first expedition to the site. He helped me with my first ever capture seasons. Um, he, along with Talata Pierre, taught me all about the history of the park. And we had these amazing conversations on, you know, at that time, it was like a nine hour hike to get out there for the first time. And so it's like, what have I done? Where are we going? You know, and, and Emil's quote was always, only one more hour, only one more hour, right? And so that became our joke was like, oh, one more hour Emil, right? You know, and then, and then Justin, I mean, he's, <laughs> he's basically my dad. He told me I'm like his sister. So I'm like, wait a minute, I'm not that old. <laughs> but, but like, he, he's like my dad and he really, um, he introduced me to everything. Help, he helped me establish the site. He did all the transects. I mean, everything, like helped me find the animals and then worked with me for the next three years to really get the project established, to get the site established. Um, and to this day, 15 years later, I still go to him um, for advice and support. And so, you know, to circle back to your original question, I'd say my first impression and my first field experience was really challenging. Um, and I had lots of growing pains I had to work through, but it all worked out, thanks in large part to the colleagues in Ranamafan who have essentially become like a part of my extended family. Um, when did the two of you first meet? Yeah, so Stacy and I first met at that same time. So it was uh, my first field experience as a grad student. And then Stacy was just winding down her dissertation research. So she'd already been there for over a year. Um, and if I remember correctly, we only really overlapped for a couple of weeks. Um, and that's in part because her work was in Vatu, my work was in a couple of different sites. And so we'd go out on our expeditions, come back, reconvene at the main research station at CVB, and that's when we'd hang out. Um, but even still, I think, you know, two weeks, three weeks that we saw each other, we became really close really quickly. Yeah, in the field you go through everything together. So it's like time is accelerated and you have all these shared experiences that bond you. And that really set us up for this friendship that um, I think it's been 15 years, Andrea, I just counted. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, there are a lot of vulnerable periods throughout academic life. And one of the most vulnerable times is when you're a grad student. And that's a really important time to have a support system. And we ended up being that for each other. I think every, every conversation that we have has a little bit of the personal and the professional um, built into it. And when I was a postdoc at Stony Brook and Andrea was a grad student there, we were able to grow that relationship into professional collaboration too, including some of the work we'll talk about today that was actually funded by Leakey Foundation. <laughs> you both now direct <laughs> lemur sites and your own labs. Andrea, what was your path to where you are now? Yeah, so since my time as a grad student, my research focus has really diversified into work that's both collaborative and integrative, and it intersects with primate behavioral ecology, molecular ecology, and conservation. 
And so on the one hand, I continue to run the Rough Gleamer, Ranamafana Rough Gleamer project in Mangevu that I established as a grad student in 2005. And this is where my colleague, Tim Webster and I are currently focusing on a project that was partially funded by Leakey and Gordon Getty. So thank you so much for your generous support. Um, and through this project, we're investigating the ontogeny of the Rough Gleamer gut microbiome and its long-term health and fitness outcomes. Um, and then I also have several grad students who are out there working on a bunch of interrelated um, projects. So studying things like Rough Gleamer movement ecology, nutrition, energetics, and vocal communication. And then um, in addition to my field seat, I now also direct the Primate Molecular Ecology Lab at Hunter, where we're focused primarily on primate conservation genetics. And so this includes research focused on lemur landscape genetics, population demography, um, and then also ring-tailed lemur molecular forensics. And Stacey, what has your path been? Uh, like Andrea, my current research focus has also broadened quite a bit since grad school. So I started off studying how the environment impacts behavior and physiology using a hormone cortisol as a measure of environmental challenge. So I was really focused on stressors. And now my work's also a lot more collaborative and integrative and incorporates new tools to understand behavior at multiple levels of organization from genes to microbes, populations, looking at collective behavior and individual behavior and especially how individuals are interacting with one another. And a big part of my research now is on shared infant care. But my work has also branched off in a lot of new directions. And one part of my work is really focused on cooperative behaviors, cooperative relationships, how they occur, what benefits they give to those who are actually cooperating and participating in them. And I study these relationships within species among males. And um, mostly that work has been with Kathy Jack and Capuchins and with Becca Lewis studying Shefok. And also between species, working with Evan, Evan McLean, looking at dog-kid interactions and the psychological and physiological benefits of those interactions. And most recently, I'm working with folks in the colleges of medicine and nursing, which is not really a place that I thought I would go early in yeah. my career, um, studying the roles of various <clears throat> hormones, maternal child bonding in people, and seeing if we can then leverage those beneficial hormone behavior relationships to improve maternal health, for example, to help um, women avoid um, relapsing um, and specifically opioid relapse disorder in new moms. <clears throat> Sorry, <laughs> take <No>. a drink. <laughs> so a large part of that work is in the lab. And um, as you mentioned, at the University of Arizona, I direct the lab for the evolutionary endocrinology of primates where we do a lot of methods development so we can measure a variety of hormones in different species using different types of samples, like fecal samples and urine samples. And in Ranamathon, I'm excited to start working with two new grad students in continuing our work on lemur reproduction, infant care, health, and conservation. And I am always trying to expand the non-invasive toolkit. And one part of that is developing a way to reliably identify individuals. And it's a really important to know who individuals are when you're studying them. So we've worked with a team of computer scientists to develop a face recognition algorithm for rebelly lemurs. And now um, Rachel Jacobs and I are working with a tech team on a smartphone app that we can use in real time in the field. Rebelly lemur faces, as you can see by this picture here, they vary quite a bit, but it'd be really hard to tell individuals apart, especially when you're like, you know, in real time in the forest. And we wanna be sure that we're watching who we think we're watching. So obviously, uh, being able to identify lemurs is quite important to both of your research. We are now going to ask all of you viewing to try your hand at lemur identification. So how it will work is Andrea and Stacy will share two photos of lemurs. And your job is to figure out if the two photos are of the same lemur or if they are two different lemurs. So. This is round one, and uh, when you put in your assessment, please be sure to put round one in your chat because there will be several rounds, and we want to make sure that your answer goes to the correct um, round. So, uh, Stacey and Andrea, what what might help our viewers tell if these are the same lemur or different lemurs? Okay, so one hint is to pay attention to e uh, easily noticeable markings. So things like variations in hair color or hair patterning or scars or unusual traits like bent tails, right? So features that aren't going to change through time because you have to be able to repeatedly ID these animals. 
In Rebelli lemurs in particular, like you're seeing here, the males and females have different facial markings, which really helps a lot. So this is a male that you're looking at here with like the white kind of teardrops around their eyes and the females don't have that. They might have a little bit of white, but it's not to the extent that the males do. And you might see that males have like these little, it looks like really greasy heads. That it actually is a little greasy head. That's something that might change over time though, depending on how much marking they're doing. So the shape of their head might differ. We're starting to get some responses. Let's see. Let's see what people are are saying. We have some saying different. Some saying same. What else do we have? Oh, another one different. <laughs> wow, we're like 50-50 right now, huh? Yeah, I think so. I think we have the majority of assessments in. Um, and it seems like people think these two lemurs are or at least the majority of our viewers think they are different lemurs. What is the correct answer? Wah, wah. <laughs> they are the same. Okay, now we're going to go to round two. Okay, we're going to show you another set of lemurs and see, are these two lemurs the same lemur or are they different lemurs? Submit your answers in the chat now. So this, this lemur does not have those white markings around the face so that that's right. This is a female lemur. Yeah. Yeah. And so look too, you know, look at like the shapes of the snouts maybe, or if there's any identifying features around the eye region, the shapes of the eyes. Sometimes the ears too. Yeah. Like little differently shaped ears. But you have to be careful because sometimes the same animal might look different in different weather or from different distances, different heights. Yeah, you know, and it's and and one's a little more in shadow, so yeah, that can tricky. Like, the environment you're in can be a little tricky. Yeah, and are are, are you are you generally seeing them this close? Um, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so we're making it easier for. Our, okay, yeah. we're getting quite yeah. a few responses. Okay, let's start seeing what we got. Different, we got more. We got quite a few different. I think we're, right. we're oh, we have one, one same, but it looks like the majority of assessments are that they are different lemurs. What 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 is the correct answer? Are they the same or different? Same. Different. Uh, different, I meant. <laughs> different, I meant. I'm totally wrong. Meanwhile, I'm like, look at their noses. I'll just shut up. <laughs> yes. And this is the utility of having the app, right? Yeah. <laughs> so people like me don't screw it up. Okay. And multiple different. people on a team who can help confirm. Yeah. Okay. We will, we will, I think we all have, but this is going quicker than I thought. So we actually do have a round three. Bonus round. A bonus round. So, is there anything we should be on the lookout for this one? Um, and be sure to put in uh, the, what, what round you're we're putting you're putting in for, so we don't get the um, the wrong assessment from you for our viewers. Okay, for this one, maybe the eyes um, and just kind of general shape of the face. Um, and this again is uh, this are, these two pictures are females. You can, the females also have um, white bellies and the males don't. So that's another thing that you can tell, use to tell the sexes apart. Yep, those are the same things I cue in on is looking at the eyes and the, the shape of the, the face and the, again, the snout. Okay, we're starting to get some responses. Let's see here, what do we have? We have one, one same. One different, another one same. Okay, it seems like our our assessments are leaning towards that they are the same lemur. So, what is our what is our round three answer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and Nick pointed it out. So it's those white rings around the eyes, and that's yeah. Stacy confirmed for me, but I think that's just it. It's it's skin. It's not. It's a naked part of the face. So yeah, that's not um, pelage. Yeah. Yeah, especially the males um, that those really beautiful like white spots, that's just skin. So like, yeah, the hair is not growing there. Yep. Well, that was a 
fun activity and it was actually trickier than than I um than I thought. Actually, I had to um right before the episode, I had to like double check to make sure we had the correct answers cuz I wasn't 100% sure myself. So, um but uh, I'm real not really excited to hear more about your research. Uh, before we turn over the virtual floor to you, um I just want to you know, remind if our viewers, if you're enjoying this episode, to be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Twitter to be sure to get reminded of upcoming episodes. So now let us turn the virtual floor over to the two of you and hear more about your research. I'm very excited about this. So um, Andrea and I both study al maternal care, which is when infant care is distributed across several different individuals. And it can include behaviors that require a lot of energy, like babysitting and nursing and carrying, or other less expensive behaviors like grooming or just like holding and huddling with the infant. Because primate moms nurse their infants, they're typically responsible for most of the infant care in mammals. So this is one way to reduce that energetic burden for moms distributed across several individuals and increase the energy put into infants from all these other individuals. So it's hypothesized to lead to higher reproductive rates in primates. Moms can reproduce faster and over a lifetime that adds up to more births. And early comparative work found support for this in primates, but that work either totally excluded lemurs from the analyses or categorized all of them as having exclusive maternal care. Um, but quite a bit of lemur species have some form of owl maternal care. So on this figure here, species with black circles has some form of it. And in the, our presentation, you might see AMC for owl maternal care. Um, so we don't have data for a lot of lemur species. There are over 100 lemur species. Um, this shows that owl maternal care is actually present in all the lemur families to some extent. So we compiled this information and assessed whether owl maternal care increases reprodu reproductive rates in lemurs like it does in other primates. But we did not find this for all lemurs. So since lemurs have strictly timed reproduction and most reproduce only once per year at the same time every year, it might actually be impossible to change the pace of reproduction. So um, instead the benefits might just be higher infant survival and not faster reproduction. This type of comparative study that we did where you have a single value for every species that you're looking at actually swamps out individual variation, giving just a single mean for every species. So when we're talking about species that have facultative owl maternal care, where it sometimes occurs, but not everyone does it all the time, then you kind of tend to have lower values for each of these species. So we knew that we had to use another method to better understand the evolution of owl maternal care in species with facultative care. So we were interested in zooming in on individuals to see what could explain individual variation. So we focused on red light lemurs because I had seen siblings and dads carrying infants before, but didn't really know what was going on there, hadn't studied it. And this picture on the left shows a dad with an infant. Now you guys know that's the dad with the teardrop eyes. And then there's a tightly bonded um, pair on the right. These are parents. Oops, I lost you guys. There you are. All right. Um, red belly lemurs have some tricks up their sleeves for dealing with the cost of reproduction. So like other lemurs, they have really strict seasonal breeding and many species time reproduction. So food is around and supporting them throughout reproduction. This figure shows the number of red belly lemur births in each month of the year. And they have a birth peak from September to October or November, it kind of shifted more recently. And everyone gives birth in the community around the same two weeks. But this figure shows that they also have a little bit of flexibility and this is more flexibility than we've seen in other lemur species. And um, we've seen them give birth in eight different months. And this was over a course of 15 years, um, not consecutive years, but combined data. But this timing is really important because when they do have babies out of peak season, they're not successful at all. So this figure shows that 80% of infants born in the birth peak survive, while none of the infants born outside the peak survive. So there's really strong selection for them to time it right. So this is what that looks like. If they time it right, weaning occurs when fruit is abundant. And this shows fruit availability throughout 19 months. And the weaning period is highlighted in gray. And this is all from Ranama Farm. And this is a time when infants are starting to feed independently and moms are recovering from feeding and carrying and growing infants. So having fruit at this time is really important. But that means that birth occurs here when fruit is scarce. 
So this timing leaves infants vulnerable for a few months after birth, and that's actually when we see most of the infants dying within the first few months of life, well before food even becomes abundant. And we know that this is a challenging time. So when I was a grad student, I collected fecal samples to look at hormone, the hormone cortisol, and this can help identify periods when energy is needed because of stressors in the environment. So elevated cortisol levels indicate some kind of a challenge. And the boxes here show fecal cortisol levels in adults in 19 months. And here is how it coincides with the birth season and with fruit availability. So this is a really challenging period for these guys. Babies are born, fruit is scarce, and adult cortisol is really high. Actually, it's highest out of the entire study. So we wanted to know if our maternal care behavior could help during that period between birth and weaning. And we started um, by documenting who does it and how much, since we just didn't really know that much about it yet. And the behaviors we focused on were carrying, grooming, playing, holding, and huddling. And this is a picture of huddling here where they're all curled up in that ball. And we also calculated a composite score called total al maternal care. So you'll see um, something called total AMC, and that's just everything combined. Al maternal care could be a strategy to help buffer moms at this time. It's pretty substantial. Dads are in contact with their infants as much as human dads are, which is a lot, about 27% as much as moms. But there's a lot of individual variation, which we think is part of the coolest thing here. So here's just a sampling of caring behavior in dads. And there's data from two years here, so you'll see a couple dads repeated. And you can see that some dads carry a lot, even more than the average mom, like Tolstoy here. And some dads carry really minimally or not at all, like Helsinki. Um, there's a little bit of variation across years, even within individuals. And there's a lot of variation in other behaviors that we measured as well. So we don't know what that individual variation is tied to in terms of maternal condition, the condition of the caregivers, condition of the infant, other factors like the state of the environment. And so we started to explore this by looking at hormonal differences that can facilitate paternal care. So we're honing in on dads here. And we know that hormones change in moms during two types of interactions with their offspring in particular. First, when they're cooking them, so they're gestating and they're nourishing them, their babies are growing. And then afterwards, after the infants are born and they're interacting with their infant, so in response to that interaction. And there's some evidence that this happens in dads too. And we wanted to know what hormones were doing when dads were expecting infants and then afterwards when they were interacting with them. And we were interested in several hormones, but I'm going to focus on two in particular, estradiol and androgens. We measured estradiol because in moms, it increases responsiveness and sensitivity to infants, and it elevates during gestation in men and tamarind monkey dads. And these are species where dads almost always provide care for their infants, or there's been like strong selection for that, potentially to prepare them for the birth of their infant. So it's thought that these hormonal changes during their meat's gestation prepare them to start caring for the kid as soon as they're born. And here we found that also elevates prior to birth fourfold in red belly lemurs, which I think is notable because there's so much variation in paternal care. So this also occurs in a species where they're not obligated, there's not obligate paternal care, but it's more facultative. So um, we have this nice increase when their, their partner's gestating, but then it just decreases after the birth of the infant. So it really isn't associated with short-term changes in um, behavior and response to interacting with the infant. We also looked at androgen levels, and androgens are hormones like testosterone that often are associated with behaviors like aggression, and they decrease as men and other species with a lot of paternal care transition into fatherhood. And so these um, drop as they transition from potentially seeking mates into um, taking care of kids. So it's also thought that it would be a waste of energy to maintain really high levels when investing in kids and that aggressive behavior isn't really a desirable thing to have when you're interacting with kids either. But we know less about acute changes associated with care behavior or how androgen levels change due to interacting um, with the infants. So we thought that the more al maternal care a male performed, the lower his androgen levels would be. Here, just pay attention to the highlighted line, that's dads. We had also looked at siblings, but we're just gonna focus on dads here. And this shows that there's actually a positive relationship where you have an increase in androgens with an increase in alma maternal care. Um, and we can look at specific behaviors to understand this a little bit better. Going back to our five specific behaviors, androgens 
androgens actually did decrease with more carrying with a negative estimate here, but huddling shown here and even more so grooming have very strong positive relationships with androgens. A 1% increase in androgens was met with a 1% increase in huddling, but 19.2% increase in grooming. So we think that this is because there's likely a decrease in androgens once they pair up. So once they transition into being paired and becoming dads, but within that lower range, lower or higher androgen levels might facilitate different types of care, like nurturing care types of care versus protective types of care. So how do you raise a red belly lemur? Um, they really need to have babies during the birth peak. That's um, not really flexible in terms of the success of the infant. Um, but that time between birth and weaning is when our maternal care occurs and everyone in the family helps. Dads have a lot of variation in how much they help though. And this could be facilitated by hormonal changes during their mate's pregnancy and later in response to interacting with the infant. And this has led us to a zillion more questions that we're continuing to ask with this species. Okay. And so now if we return to our original study, you'll remember that we didn't, oops, there we go, didn't find evidence um, that allomaternal care improves reproductive output in lemurs in the same way that it did in other primates, with the exception of parking and nesting species. Um, there we go, where reproductive output did actually improve. And so what I'll do here is describe some of the work that I've done in black and white rough lemurs Next slide, please. There we go. Um, so I'll describe some of the work in black and white rough lemurs that may help to explain some of these results. So rough lemurs have a really unusual form of allomaternal care that really sets them apart from most primates. So while rough lemurs are seasonal breeders, um, they exhibit a very different strategy of reproductive timing from red-bellied lemurs, and this is something that we call boom-bust reproduction. And so in this system, females are capable of reproducing every year, so they could have an interbirth interval of one, right? Um, however, interbirth intervals or the, the time between successive births can actually be highly variable, um, and this can vary um, where, you know, some populations will delay reproduction for as many as five successive years, like in the Manumbu population you see down at the bottom or the Mangevu population um, that you see in the middle. And these interbirth intervals can vary by site, so geographic location, they can vary through time even within a single population, and they can also vary among individuals even within a single breeding season. And so we think this may be a type of anticipatory breeding where females are queuing into something, so climatic, ecological, social signals in the environment that indicate optimal times for reproduction. So when they do eventually breed, females can make up for lost time, so to speak, by bearing large litters of two to five offspring, right? So even if they don't breed for five years, then in the breeding year, they basically, you know, pop out a bunch of kids and it kind of it catches them up, right? Um, and so much like newborn puppies, babies are born altricial, which means that they're essentially helpless. Their eyes are closed, they can't cling from birth, and this necessitates that moms transport their infants orally until they're capable of independent travel. And so in order to cope with these large litters of altricial young, mothers will nest their infants during the earliest stages of their development. So as you can see here in the figure on your right, these polygons indicate female ranges. So each color is a different um, female's territory within the communal range. The stars within those polygons indicate those females' nests that they built throughout their territory. And then those little black dots indicate park sites that they start to use after, um, after infants have developed a bit more. And so what we see is that during the first month of life, Moms are their infants' sole care providers. So it's, it's just them, they stay at the nest the vast majority of the time. And after that point, they then um, transfer their infants out of their natal nests by about uh, a month. And then they begin transferring them among nests and park locations throughout the community. And so those are indicated in this slide by those little white dots. So those are nest and parking locations throughout um, the larger territorial range. And then by six weeks of age, moms begin to periodically crush their litters together 
into communal nests or sort of colloquially kindergartens. And those are indicated here by the colored pie charts. And so what you can see is in each of those pie charts, those different colors indicate the identities of females who crushed their infants together. And so some of those nests were only used by certain females. Some of those uh, nests were used by multiple pairs of females just in different times. And sometimes you could see as many as three different litters being parked into a single communal nest at any point in time. Now, when those infants are in their nests, this is the point when we start to see helpers, including other mothers, their preferred adult male partners, or subadult and juvenile group members, and they'll all provide allomaternal care to the infants at those nests. So what we see um, is that communal nest use is actually facultative in this species. So much like red-bellied lemurs, it's variable across individuals. So not all females crush their young, but those that do exhibit preferences for crushing partners. And so this figure here illustrates a sociogram that's uh, representing um, communal nesting um, relationships among females. And so again, those colored nodes indicate female identities that were referenced in the earlier slide, and they're oriented according actually to their, um, their spatial proximity throughout the communal territory. And so you'll see that females red and yellow don't have any um, nesting associations. So those females were um, the sole care providers for the entire, um, the first three months of infant life, whereas females green and blue held a really strong nesting relationship. So their kids were parked together in communal nests a bunch. And then female green and pink down there also communally nested their kids, but a lot less often than, than green and blue did. And you'll also see percentages next to each of those nodes. And those percentages indicate their infant survival by three months of age. Okay, so keep that, keep that in your head. Now, interestingly, in terms of preferences, we see that it's unrelated to a female's proximity to other mothers, okay? So it's not just a convenience thing. It's not like you running next door to your neighbor's house and saying, hey, can you take my kids? I've got to go run some errands, right? They're, it's, not, it's not related to proximity. Rather, what we see is that when mothers do crush their infants, they preferentially crush them with their long-term friends, that is animals with whom they share these long-term um, patterns of social affiliation, and also their relatives, right? So they're, they're cooperating and communally nesting with friends and relatives. And moreover, what we see is that communally nesting females share significantly higher average pairwise relatedness than sort of baseline relatedness amongst females overall. And I should note at this point that not all communal nesters were relatives and not all relatives communally nested, which suggests that this behavior cannot be explained by kin selection alone. And so why might females even do this in the first place? And it turns out mothers benefit from crushing young. So there seems to be a mutual benefit that everybody's gaining by cooperatively caring for these kids. And so these box plots illustrate feeding time before and after the onset of communal nesting. And so what you can see is in the, that right-hand panel, we can see that once females begin to crush their young, the females that do participate in communal nesting, represented by that orange box plot, spend significantly more time feeding than females who do not ever communally nest their kids. Okay. Moreover, if we look specifically within just those communally nesting females, we see that the more a female crushes her offspring, that is the more time her babies spend in communal nests with other litters, the less time she has to spend at her nest and the more time she's able to spend feeding and foraging, suggesting that the more a female crushes her young, the lower her energetic burden. Okay. In addition to this, it's not just moms that are benefiting, right? So we also see that infants who are crushed, so the infants um, who are parked into these communal nests in these kindergartens, and uh, represented here by those orange circles, experience significantly higher survival to three months of age. And this is when communal nesting ceases. Um, so they they're, have significantly higher survivorship than um, those babies that are represented by purple that are never, never crushed in communal nests. And it's, again, it's not just the presence or absence of communal crushing, but it's the total amount of time those babies spend in those nests. So as you spend more time in a communal nesting situation, your infants are more likely to survive.
And so in sum, if we think back to our original research question of how allomaternal care in nesting and parking species that are seasonal breezers, right? They're, they're really constrained by photo period. How are they increasing their reproductive output? Um, and it seems like, at least in the case of rough lemurs, they're employing this anticipatory breeding strategy where females will synchronously bear litters of altricial young, which they will then communally rear in these shared nests. And then this ultimately improves infant survival during these really rare reproductive events. Thank you both so much. I think I feel like crush is my new favorite word. <laughs> Sounds easy, right? <laughs> so both red-bellied lemurs and black and white ruffed lemurs are threatened species. Uh, what are the biggest threats to them that they're facing? The largest threat is habitat degradation. And on top of that, Madagascar is consistently ranked by USAID as one of the top five most climate vulnerable countries. Both of us have conducted studies predicting the effects of climate change and habitat loss on lemurs, and we found they'll have de devastating effects on the density and distribution of species. Um, the map that you'll show in just a second shows, yeah, that one shows projected forest loss with strict protection of parks on the left and then relaxed protection of parks on the right, and suggests that as much as 97% of Madagascar's eastern forests will be lost by the year 2070. Al maternal care, though, seems to be a pretty good strategy that affords them some flexibility. And we think this will be particularly important in the face of rapidly changing climates, um, rapidly changing environments with increased habitat degradation, where genetic adaptation isn't likely to help them keep pace um, in terms of um, responding to these rapid changes. And how is conservation uh, incorporated into your research? Uh, so because a lot of my work is, is these days, it's really integrative and it is really collaborative. Um, it really allows us to approach um, conservation issues from multiple different perspectives. So for instance, that map you just saw comes from recent work um, from myself and Tony Lynn Morelli and colleagues that has really allowed us to identify potential climate refugia, which is um, you know, areas where 50 or 70 years from now, they may still provide some suitable habitat for rough lemurs. And so we, with that information, we can recommend these areas um, for formal protection. Um, in addition, much of the ongoing work with my grad students will be used to study patterns of rough lemur occupancy, meaning are they present or absent from forests um, in response to forest regeneration. And that can be used to guide reforestation efforts in the region, um, particularly in important areas of rough lemur gene flow. And then finally, as you can see here, um, I'm also collaborating with some really great nonprofits on several other projects, including those that use our genetic results to inform um, translocation efforts into um, the Batampana Park by um, as one example, and also to help curb the illegal pet trade of wild ring-tailed lemurs. Um, for me, so much of the success of Ranamafan National Park is due to the tour guides and research technicians there, who in some cases grew up in the forest and in many cases have worked there for decades and have like, incredible expertise covering everything in that forest. Um, unfortunately, our current structure of how scientific knowledge is shared excludes a lot of people with a lot of expertise. So one of the projects I've been able to work on during the pandemic is a storytelling project to preserve that ecological knowledge and provide a platform to share it through radio broadcasts and video vignettes. And we recorded interviews on Zoom. So this was um, a project that we were able to do during lockdown and they're now in the editing stage and they'll be shared in Madagascar during a movie night in town, we hope, and on the radio and also on the Ranamafan Tours website and the Center of Albio YouTube channel. And we've shared a couple of links in the chat, and I believe uh, w w at least one of them will, will, or will maybe both of them will have, um, have inf but we'll also, um, <laughs> we'll also, you know, follow up with, with that information. Um, so let's now take some questions from our audience. We have quite a few questions. So um, if you have not submitted your question, now is the time to do so. Uh, so the sooner you get those in, the more likely you your question will be asked today. So um, let's take our, our first question. Cheryl asks, 100 lemur species, can they hybridize? And if lemurs are under threat of extinction, 
Might there be some pressure for different species to mate? Um, I could just say, yeah, I think I think this is always increasing that as of now, there are about 111 recognized species and there are um, populations where there are hybridized um, uh, lemur species. Um, my familiarity with that is based on Steg Johnson's work uh, and, and drink draw, but maybe Andrea, you know a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of the extent to which I know about um, it's Calaris and Albicalaris, I believe. So it's two common brown lemur species that come into contact and they hybridize with each other. Um, I think though the bigger issue than um, species sort of feeling like pressure to hybridize with each other is that they aren't going to even be able to necessarily come in contact much longer because of all this forest loss. Um, what we're seeing um, in rough lemurs certainly, and but also in lots of other animals is that they're becoming um, completely isolated. So they're becoming these island habitats where gene flow is completely restricted and animals are only interbreeding with each other so that you're actually seeing lots of interbreeding within a species that can lead to lots of problems down the road. But it's a good question, yeah. Let's take our next question from the audience. So Nat asks, there's some evidence for house mice that females show strong preferences for who they communally nest with. Are there particular attributes that drive female-female partner preferences for nesting in rough lemurs? That's an awesome question. Um, definitely something I'm interested in continuing with. I mean, we do know, so they're, you know, they're, they're, some of them are relatives, some of them are friends. So that does seem to be motivating those social nesting um, situations. But there's, there are plenty of other things that might drive that. Um, I don't know the answer just yet. Um, but luckily, because we do these captures, we're able to, you know, every year we capture the animals and we can collect a whole slew of, you know, morphological, physiological, um, biomedical information from them that will allow us to address these kinds of questions moving forward. Sounds like a good future Leaky Foundation grant. Indeed. Um, <laughs> yes, Stacey, please. do you have anything to add or, or should we take the next question? Nope, Andrea is the expert on communal okay. nesting. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and take the next question. Uh, Meredith asks, I've heard that communal nests of, uh, of communal nests in penguins, but not mammals. It's so interesting. Are there lemur, are, lemur, are these lemurs the only primates or mammals that do this? Definitely not the only mammals. So things like, um, mice and also lioness, right? Lions will do this, um, warthogs will do this. There's a whole bunch of different mammals that have sort of converged on this same rearing strategy. Um, and what was the second part of the question? So it's not just mammals and then within lemurs, um, rough lemurs do it. And then it seems like the only other species that maybe does this is um, mouse lemurs. So maybe the mouse lemurs, maybe the fat-tailed dwarf lemurs. And what's cool about that is that they are also litter bearing. So it doesn't seem like you really see that same sort of strategy where all of the females are synchronizing literally to within like three days of each other in terms of mating and then all having babies within three weeks of each other. And so that's unlike Stacy's stuff where you see a whole bunch of variation throughout the year. Rough lemurs, it's like it happens in October or it doesn't happen at all. Um, and I think that's what really like sets them up to have this kind of communal breeding strategy. And that's also why I think it's happening with the mouse lemurs too. And are there any other primates outside of lemurs? I mean, it's in very different ways. So humans, right? And people probably have have very differing views on this because I think commonly we, we refer to ourselves or to humans as being cooperative breeders. Um, but I think actually cooperative breeding is, is a very different kind of system. And that's what you see in Kelotrichine monkeys, for instance, where you've got a dominant female who's breeding and there's reproductive suppression of all of the other females in the group. And then you've got variable care by offspring and, and dads. But with communal breeding, that's where multiple females are breeding at the same time. And then, do, you know, it takes a, a village to raise a, raise a child. Like that's the same idea, right? Rough lemurs raise their, their children as a village. Um, and so I think humans are, are another example within primates of communal breeders. Let's take the next question from the audience. Let's see here. Uh, H asks, what is the COVID-19 situation like in Madagascar? <sighs> you want it's to field that, Stacey? Sure, yeah, it's not great right now. Um, they, 
Um, I haven't read the news on it very, very recently. I know in um, like beginning days, it, it seems like, you know, it there was a, a substantial amount of it, but um, there weren't a lot of deaths potentially because the population is a bit on the young side. Um, I know that there was a study using blood bank donations that found 60% of those samples were positive um, for COVID. Early on, um, there were various remedies that were um, touted within the country and they decided not to participate in COVAX, which is you know, a way to distribute vaccine equitably across countries of the world. But now they have joined COVAX and um, hopefully will become vaccinated. And I think right now there's like another surge in, in COVID right now that might be a little bit more dangerous. And I'm, I've, I was just looking for it. I can't find it. Maybe we can share the link later. But we have a colleague, um, Fidi Razambainarivu, who's he's um, based in Madagascar, but he's currently a postdoc at Princeton. And he and some of his colleagues, because the because of the lack of transparency in Madagascar with these COVID cases, he and his colleagues have actually started. Pu they put together their own website that trace that tracks um, the COVID situation daily. And so anytime new information comes out, they update that website with all kinds of infographics and stuff, which is really awesome. I'm having a hard time finding it, but maybe we can, um, I can give it to you later to share with people or something. And then how, how is COVID impacting your research? Um, mine stopped. So, you know, I was super excited. I had, you know, we have, like I say, the, the seasonal breeding happening and I had gotten funding to go out and study this and, um, we were really ramping up and and then it just, you know, March came around and we shut down, pulled everyone out of the forest. And, um, you know, recently we just had one expedition go out to sort of clear trails and check up and make sure that the animals are still there. The trails are, you know, still intact. There isn't anything illegal going on in the park. But, you know, it's, it's hard to know, right? And because you, you don't want to you don't want to get the animals sick, right? We have a responsibility to the animals. We also have a responsibility to the people. We don't want the text to get sick. We don't want local communities getting sick. Um, you know, luckily it seems maybe, maybe not, um, like transmission is a little bit lower because so much of life is is outside, at least in the more rural communities. But um, yeah, it's hard. And it's hard on their end too, right? Because all of a sudden their their resources, their funding has dried up. And so much of Madagascar's economy is driven by ecotourism and research that, you know, um, it, it's hard. It feels helpless. It feels very helpless to not be able to, to help our friends um, in situations like this. So that's my side of things, at least. Yeah. And for me also, you know, my research stopped and we also had some people samples that were supposed to be shipped the day that the airports closed down and they're still stuck in Madagascar. You know, we've had, you know, funding, well, the lab shut down too, so we couldn't actually analyze them. But once the lab opened up, we really wanted to analyze them and, um, and you know, provide data to our funders. And um, so we, have, we haven't been able to get those samples still. They're still stuck there. Um, and so not only has the research in Madagascar come to a halt, but we've had to totally, you know, transition the type of work that we're doing on this end to um, back in the lab and, and here in the States. Um, and then the opportunity, I'm really, really grateful to the School of Anthropology here because um, this opportunity came up to apply for funding to support um, basically like for people who need to change their research focus given the pandemic. And so that's the funding that supported this storytelling project. And um, that was, yeah, that was just like Andrea said, um, our friends and colleagues in Madagascar are completely out of work because there are no tourists coming in, no researchers coming in. Um, they're able to do, you know, some work, but it's not, you know, don't have the study abroad groups coming and, and things like that. And so um, this was one, that storytelling project was one way that we could like still do something, um, which I think is actually a really important something too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um, but yeah, we're, you know, I, I have two new graduate students this year and our plan was to go to Madagascar um, in the summer so they could like get going. And so it's really had an impact on their, you know, trajectory in graduate school as well as graduate students that we work with in, in um, Madagascar. Thank you so much for the update. We have a couple more questions. Uh, Alba asks, 
This is an amazing talk. I have a bunch of questions, mainly about red-bellied lemurs. Do subadults disperse? Do you know of any ecological constraints? Uh, the subadults do. So about um, three-ish years old, there's a little wiggle, wiggle room there, then they, they leave and the pair maintains that same territory. Um, so kids will like come and go with parents stay there. Um, ecological constraints on, on dispersal, maybe. So one of the drawbacks to doing totally non-invasive research <laughs> is that, well, there are a lot of them. <laughs> um, there are a lot of questions I have that I just can't answer. And uh, dispersal, like what happens to animals when they leave a group is one of them. So we don't have um, radio collars on them, so we can't track them. This is why we think individual ID will be really important if that app can actually help us identify individuals who have left and then come back years later, or we just discover them later. Um, or if um, other folks just doing censuses, like they can use this app and it's not us, then they can tell us, oh, we saw, we saw this guy way over here. And that would be really useful to us. But the, I have like one anecdote um, that shows kind of like dispersal distance. I think with Andrea, we'll start looking at the genetics and like figure figure that out. But we have, so we're really far from knowing constraints on actual like dispersal and like why they disperse at different ages and how far. Oh, well, let's take uh, our next question. I think that has in me, uh, uh, number two. Is there <laughs> a subpopulation of solitary or floater individuals? Do they challenge the stability of pairs? Yeah, so this is making, maybe maybe this comes from like a kind of a, a TT monkey um, frame. Uh, so I've been thinking about this because of the TT monkey um, research. You don't, you see solitary individuals once in a while, but not all that often. And we have seen a couple of group turnovers. So one, the ones that I've actually personally witnessed are when like an adult in the group dies and then like a new in this case, it was a female who died and a new female came in for a little bit, left a new female, and finally like one of the females stuck. Um, one that happened while I was there, but I didn't see, um, the adult female disappeared and like the next day there was another female, but we don't know if like that was an, an aggressive interaction or not. Like I said, they, they really just avoid each other. There's like no aggression <laughs> in this species at all. Um, and then when that female came in, she actually made it this was like the most dramatic thing that ever happened in Red Belly Lemur World that I know of. She made it with a subadult um, that was there. It was really close. I think it was like three or four years old, actually. So it's like probably like reproductively adult. Um, out of season, way out of season. And um, so there's like some funky stuff that happens, but it's really rare. We don't see it too often. Actually, we do have, we have one more question from the audience. Hmm. When do you expect to get back to Madagascar next research season? Good question. Who right now it's, it's closed, the airports are closed, the borders are closed, so we really don't know when they'll even open up again. I guess um, for me, you know, I teach during the academic year, and so the summer really is the only time that I can get over there. So that's not gonna happen this summer, so I'm hopeful maybe next summer depending on funding. Yeah, and for me, I actually, um, this fall, I actually am on course release because I was hoping <laughs> to go back over there. Um, I'm fully vaccinated and all these things, like hoping to get there just to get something going, you know, or at the very least, bring over some receivers and just bring over gear, bring camping equipment, right? Like anything that we could use to collect data um, but again, like Stacey mentioned, it's totally dependent on on borders opening and also, you know, what is the responsible thing to do as researchers? Like we we, we all need to be responsible. So, um, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, if it's not this fall, then next summer, probably. My last question for you both is, do you have any advice for those watching who might be interested in pursuing primate behavior ecology is a uh, career. Yeah, so what I, what I tell every student, and this isn't necessarily specific to behavior, but I think it's just good advice generally, is that you don't know what you're going to like until you try it. And so, you know, you may think, on the one hand, you may think, oh, my, my dream has always been to study primates. And then you get out there and you're like, this is the pits. There's leeches. It's freezing. The animals just sleep all day. Like, ugh, I hate this. Or you could think, you know, oh, I'm not, 
I'm not a camping person. Like, I don't know, that doesn't really, I'm not smart enough. Or I'm, like all of these excuses we make for ourselves. Um, and then you get out there and you realize like, oh my God, this, if I could do this for my career, like I would be the happiest person on the planet. And so I just tell all people, you know, just try it, just give it a shot. And you know, you don't have to stick with it if you don't want to, but if you may, you know, it may change the rest of your life. So. And, and building off of that, every experience that you have, I feel like you can take something, you can learn something from every experience. And there's so many different species out there and so many different habitats and countries, you know, to study these species that like, I did not love my first, you know, I, I shouldn't say this. So, you know, I worked with kids, I learned they were not my species. I worked with macaques, I learned they were not my species. I worked with squirrel monkeys, I learned they were not my species, you know, and, and worked in different types of environments. And like I said, that first trip to Madagascar, I was like, this is really physically hard. I don't know if I can do it. But like, that also became something I was really proud of, the fact that like I yeah. could do it. And it became like this, the most, the, the happiest place I've, I've ever been, right? And the happiest moment of my life being, you know, working in that forest. Um, and not, you know, even in Madagascar, I remember, I think it was like a year or two years before I even traveled to other places and realized, oh my God, you can study lemurs on the beach and you can actually <laughs> like, the incredible visibility of what they're doing. So like really like, you know, if, you know, give it a chance. But um, my main piece of advice would be, and again, this applies broadly, is to really find a mentoring team, not just one person, but like really reach out to mentors. Even, you know, I know this is really hard when you're shy um but there are a lot of people that can do a lot for you and the and throughout your whole life like andrea and i still talk with like linda taylor who is our undergrad advisor and you know have you know, just keep like building up that team and building up that team throughout life and um you don't have to do everything on your own there's a lot of people who have already laid the groundwork for things that are happy to share those things with you and i think that's one of the things that's so um, one of the many things that are beneficial in this relationship I have with Andrea is that we're always sharing resources with each other and, you know, just really, you know, we're peers, but we're peer mentors, right? Your mentor can be anybody. Well, thank you both so much. This has been such a fun episode. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's I, been awesome. Yeah. I hope that this episode helped get everybody in the spirit of Earth Day. Uh, I've actually created a playlist that we're going to share in the chat of some of my favorite Leaky Foundation lectures and Lunch Break Science episode focused on biodiversity, ecology, primates, and more. Um, it also includes today's episode in case, well, I guess if you're watching it, <laughs> you, you already know about it, but um, <laughs> some of our other uh, our other programs. Um, so um, we also have a new episode of our origin podcast origin stories. Uh, it, it's called "How to Study an Endangered Species," featuring our, our first lunch break science speaker, uh, Zareen Machanda. Um, we also want to share an important opportunity to help us protect vulnerable primates, long-term research sites, and their local staffs. Uh, the Leakey Foundation's Primate Research Fund is a lifeline for long-term primate sites facing gaps in funding and other emergencies. Thanks to the generosity of Anne and Jeff Madgen Calda and the Anne and Gordon Getty Foundation, all donations to the Primate Research Fund will be quadrupled. This means giving $25 will have $100 of impact. Giving $250 will have $1,000 of impact. We've shared a link in the chat to help you learn more about the program and how you can help. Next time on Lunch Break Science, we will meet Leaky Foundation grantee Deming Yang, who will be discussing his work studying paleo environments and human evolution in Turkana Basin of Kenya. It's gonna be a really great episode. And it'll be on May 6th. So thank you all for taking a break from your day and feeding your brain with the Leaky Foundation. Until next time, stay hungry for knowledge. Lunch Break Science is brought to you by the Leaky Foundation and made possible by the generous support of the Anna Gordon Getty Foundation and Camilla and George Smith. Visit us at leakyfoundation.org 
to learn more about the Leakey Foundation, today's guest scientists, and how you can help support human evolution research and educational programs like Lunch Break Science. Right now, all donations to the Primate Research Fund will be quadruple matched by generous donors, meaning your impact will be quadrupled. Miss an episode of Lunch Break Science? Catch up on past episodes and browse our library of Leaky Foundation lectures on our YouTube channel. Still hungry for science and can't wait till our next episode? Check out the Leaky Foundation's award-winning podcast, Origin Stories, available wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe to Leaky Foundation's YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or sign up for our newsletter to be the first to hear about exciting upcoming episodes and programs, as well as groundbreaking discoveries in human evolution research.